Welcome to the Deep Dive, Emerald City Hockey's Seattle Kraken podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Deep Dive, Emerald City Hockey, Seattle Kraken podcast. RJ, got to start off with, with something a little easy. We're going to get do a big deep dive into the draft because that's in a couple days on Wednesday. Make sure to join us for our live first round stream over on YouTube, everybody. That's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, we're going to do the deep dive into the draft. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, maybe a little something that's going to happen tonight. Uh, we'll get to that. And then obviously the big news for next week, which is Kraken Development Camp. But first, got to start off with a big thank you, RJ. And no, I don't mean just to our sponsor, Queen Anne Beer Hall. Fantastic place in Seattle to go and watch crack and play, especially road games or any big events in the offseason or Firebirds playoff games even uh, like this yep. past week. Had a great time for that. Yeah. Uh, Got to say thanks to you to the community again. And I know we do this a lot, but it is, you know, because we are thankful for all of you uh, this time for reaching 4000 subscribers on YouTube. So just want to say thanks to everybody who's, who's subscribed to the channel. Uh, it really means a lot. Gosh, RJ, remember when it was like we hit like 100? <laughs> I know. We were so excited. And it, it doesn't stop getting exciting every big milestone with this. 1,000 was a huge one. We, we had a pretty big celebration over that one. 4,000, I mean, it's just it's beyond anything we could have imagined when we started it. Yeah, definitely. So just want to say thanks to everybody for that. Thanks to Queen Ampere Hall for sponsoring the podcast. And now on to the first bit of news, RJ, which is the Kraken released the dates for their upcoming prospect development camp. It's like the first big thing of the, the new season. Right. It's exciting that you get to see Kraken prospects. And I know we really enjoyed this last year, too. Had some had some pretty big highlight moments. I mean, they took they did it on the first day of free agency. It overlapped with that you had Shane Wright signing his entry level contract on the ice. Very exciting stuff. And you get your first look at all the new Kraken draft picks. So I know you're going to have all the players that Seattle selects uh, in the NHL draft, or at least most of them, but I think usually all yep. um, coming up here, they'll get flown right from Nashville or wherever they were uh, right to dev camp. And so we'll get to get our first look at them. Uh, so dev camp, it will be the dev camp itself is July 1st to July 5th, but not every day has on ice stuff. Sometimes you're showing the prospects around, showing them the facilities, the weight room, the, you know, the nutrition staff, all this stuff. Um, but there's two days where they will be on the ice and both of those will be open to fans. So that is July 2nd. So on the second doors open at 9.30 a.m. Uh, and the first on ice session with Team Red. So there's no rosters out yet. Uh, those will hopefully be released very soon. I mean, once you have all the draft picks, we know who's going to be coming. So Team Red will be on the ice approximately 9.45 to 10.45 a.m. And then the second session is uh, Team Blue, 11.30 to 12.30 p.m. So you got the two on ice sessions there, the whole thing running from about 9.30 to 12.30 p.m. And then on July 5th, uh, doors open at 11 30 a.m and at noon they're going to have a three-on-three -three scrimmage so that'll be really fun they had that last year you remember dylan shane wright got the final goal to cap yep. off the three-on-three -three scrimmage last year it was very exciting so excited to see who steps up and is the hero in the three-on-three -three scrimmage this year um so all these times by the way subject to change these are you know tentative times the team has put out there and let us know about but that's what it's looking like right now Oh, I am so excited for this. It was so much fun last year getting our first look. I mean, this is when everybody really fell in love with Ty Nelson. Uh, Jagger Furcus was super exciting. I'm so pumped to see them again. We'll see about, you know, Riker Evans and Shane Wright, like the two guys that, you know, many are expecting to certainly push for roster spots with the Kraken this year, but they also just played a bunch of playoff hockey. So we'll see how much they do or if they if they allow them to get a little bit of rest after that, um, big Calder Cup run that the Firebirds had. But it's it's just going to be so exciting to see whoever the Kraken just picked, you know, in, in Nashville on Wednesday and Thursday. I mean, there's going to be a lot of fun stuff going on. And I'll be up there for it. And that's, the, I think, the thing I'm most excited for is I, I'll actually get to see it in person. I'll get to hang out with everybody, see everybody again that's up there. I'm really looking forward to that one. And then, special surprise... Dog Skoy will be up there as well. So bringing Afra up for the yes! trip, going to drive up first road trip for her. Super excited to do that with her. Should be a lot of fun. And so RJ, we were thinking for that um, dev camp, that first day of dev camp on the second, 
you know, after after the second stuff goes down, finishes around 1230, maybe uh, you and I will probably go in for some media stuff. But then after that, it seems like a good time to hang out with people. Absolutely. And I've been looking forward to this for a while with you getting the chance to come up here. So if you want to meet Dylan, could, could you could you bring Afra? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Afra will be there for sure. OK, if you want to meet Dylan, you want to meet Afra, you want to hang out with both of us. Uh, that is Sunday, July 2nd, uh, after Dev Camp. I, again, I don't know how long the media stuff is going to be. We'll try and put out a time. We'll promote this on social media and everything. Yeah. But this is the first that everyone's hearing because we just finalized these plans. We just got the uh, the schedule. So uh, yeah, Sunday, July 2nd, come hang out with us. It's going to be a great time. We're going to be at that park that actually they just put. It's right on the south side of KCI. So it's right there, basically attached to Kraken Community Iceplex. So if you're going to Dev Camp, you'll already be right there. Come hang out with us. It's going to be a really great time. Yep. Super looking forward to seeing everybody. It's going to be a lot of fun regardless. I mean, just dev camp, the prospects, it's all exciting stuff, RJ. It's always exciting. It's all about optimism in the future. It's, it's, it's great. I love it. Um, and it'll tie into the draft, which we can get to in just a little bit here. But first, RJ, big, big stuff for the Kraken tonight. Right. As we as we kind of look towards the start of what's going to happen for next season, we've got to also look back at the season we just had. And that's going to kind of culminate tonight with the NHL awards on TNT. If you're in America, uh, we can all follow along and watch because um, there's there's some members of the Kraken that are going to be there, RJ. Yep, as you hold up your Maddie for Calder shirt. <laughs> yes, it's Maddie for Calder Day. Yes. Uh, Maddie Veneers will either win or not win the Calder, but Dylan, I'm I'm really liking his odds tonight. I, I mean, do too. is there any chance he doesn't win? There's always a chance, um, but I would be very surprised. Very surprised if it didn't I would be shocked. Him. Yeah. Yeah. Owen yeah. Power. And, and there good would be, for him. He's there. There would be a lot of stuff, I would <laughs> assume, going on behind the scenes if Owen Power walks away with it. Oh, for sure. A lot going on behind the scenes and, and some interesting conversation between the two of them. Of course, them being buddies from their Michigan days. And, yeah. uh, Matty Veneers was at the NHL award. So he's there already. He did uh, some media availabilities yesterday. And I think the first three questions or so were all about Owen Power <laughs> to Matty Veneers. And of course, he was happy to talk about his buddy. But uh, yeah, so the both of them are up for the award. But got to think it, it, Matty Veneers has a really good chance. And uh, we'll definitely be watching tonight. Uh, to see if he's going to win. But he's not the only Kraken up for an award. That's right. That's right. Uh, I mean, it's a, I, I love the fact that it's not just one either, too. Right? Like, And this mm -hmm. one's a big one. This one's a big one. It is. Yeah. yeah. Dave Haxtell uh, is one of the finalists for the Jack Adams Award as the best coach of the year. And, of course, that's that's a huge award. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, very important. Uh, a coach is so important to a team's success. And to see him get recognition, especially after last season, uh, mm -hmm. how rough things were. And I mean, if you remember, Dylan, the awards conversation last year, there was not even a Kraken anywhere close to no. any awards. It was just an afterthought for us from a Kraken perspective. Uh, but now Dave Haxtall in the mix for the Jack Adams. I don't know that he's going to win it. Uh, I think it's, a, it's voted on right after the regular season. So the Kraken it had an impressive regular season, yep. but uh, you know there were some other teams. I mean, heck, you had the Boston Bruins. You know, have the best regular season record ever, uh, and their coach is up for the award too. So it might be a difficult stretch, but I think for Haxtell being in the top three is uh, is really impressive. It is, and you know, every year the Jack Adams Award because there's there's always tons of deserving coaches, right? And franchises are all in various different states of competitiveness at any given time, and I think that you know. It's it's always hard to, to judge how well a coach is doing without like looking at the circumstances around them, roster, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it tends to be like, you know, every year Jack Adams a lot of times can go to the coach that makes the biggest leap from one season to another as far as their team's record. Right. Like we've seen that many, many times with the Jack Adams Award. The other thing that we'll see is just, you know, whatever, you know, uh, one of the teams that finished first in their division and just looked really good all year. I, I'm with you. I got to think that Montgomery and Boston is going to take this just because how do you not give it to the guy that coached a team to a record that nobody's ever seen before? Nobody really thought was possible. If you had asked anybody, hey, do you think a team's going to win that many games this year? Nobody would say yes. Um, and so I, I think that's probably going to, to win out for him. 
But I do think that, you know, Dave Haxtell did an incredible job this year. The growth that the Kraken were able to do all together. It's one of those things that does happen under the head coach, right? Good or bad head coaches are the face of that. Uh, it's great in moments like this. If the team disappoints, you know, they're always the first one on the chopping block. That's just the, the nature of that leadership position. But um, Dave Axel did such an incredible job with everybody, the improvements that they made, the way that this team plays like a unit, the fact that they could survive injuries when they had injuries, shuffle the lines around, the way he managed things to keep a lot of wear and tear off of guys' bodies. We talked about that as the season went on, right? Whether it was his decision with the practice schedule or his decision to play really the top three lines about equal ice time. I think those are things that don't ever really get talked about. With the Jack Adams Award, it's just, you know, kind of like, well, where did they finish in the standings? Is that significantly better than last year? We'll mm -hmm. put him in. But I do hope that, you know, as people look at him there for the awards and everything, they do take note of those things that, that he has done in Seattle that doesn't really get talked about nationally. I am hoping that this is an opportunity for some of his philosophy to, to you know, kind of at least spread around NHL circles, even if it doesn't make its way to all the fans out there. I, I certainly hope that it's something that um, his peers, you know, take a look at. Yeah, when you dive beneath the surface and when you are you're lucky enough to see all the little things that he's done, like like we have been, um, you, you really notice, you know, the impressive coaching and being able to kind of push the right buttons at the right time. And also, lastly on this, Dylan, you don't want to win this award. You don't want to win the Jack Adams, right? It's cursed. It is. If, you, if you look at the previous winners, I mean, even last year's winner, Daryl Sutter, uh, no longer with the Calgary Flames. He was let go. Uh, Rod Brindamore, two years ago, he's still with the Canes. But you know what? He is the only Jack Adams award winner who is still with the team uh, that he won the award with. So, I, I mean, you go down the list, Bruce Cassidy with the Bruins. You know, he's now with the Golden Knights. Barry Trotz with the Islanders. He's with the Preds now. Gerard Gallant with Vegas. Uh, he was fired shortly after. John Tortorella, Columbus. Like, you go say. down the list and not a single person all the way down is still with the team, you know, that they won with. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely a, a weird curse in there. I mean, you know, some of them, Gallant's been fired from a second job since then. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, uh yeah and brenda moore you know still still struggling with the hurricanes to get get pushed through there so yeah it's uh it's definitely one if you if you got to lose one this one might be the one to lose <laughs> just might be. i'd say so <laughs> gosh the sutter curse that one really took 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 fast like that was, that was fast that was really quick <laughs> that happened quickly coach of the year fired all right cool um yeah so that stuff's happening again it's going to be on tnt tonight so everybody can can uh, watch and follow along we can see um you know it's been a while since i've actually tuned into an nhl awards rj uh, i will for this one Same because here. because of the crack and everybody involved i hope they're a better show than they used to be Maybe the fact that it's not just in Vegas anymore. We won't get some C-list celebrity who happens to like hockey out there trying to make bad jokes. Uh, <laughs> hopefully hopefully that stuff's better. And the fact that it's in the same place. You know, we're just going to get lots of music. Yes. Well, I'm yeah. okay with Same that. place the draft. And you're going to have that local flavor to it. I mean, if yeah. you can't have an award show in Nashville without a lot of music and a lot of good country music. You're going to get that. Yes. So I like that they're leaning into that. I like that too. And, you know, Nashville uh, – but hopefully not as cheesy as like when they really leaned into the Vegas stuff <laughs> for, the, for those Vegas award shows. Uh, looking forward to that. And, you know, hopefully everybody would be a little bit more excited to be there. Always all the team officials because they would have to literally after the award show go and rush to get on a plane to then fly to wherever the draft was. The fact that it's taking place where the draft is so much better. Hoping that then they all have a little bit more fun and look a little bit more lively. Maybe we'll see smiles from general managers, RJ. Could you imagine? That would really be something. I, I don't know if I can imagine that. Hey, we saw a smile from Dave Haxtell at the media stuff yesterday. He was smiling. He was happy. Yeah. He was having a good time. Yeah, I, it was it was nice to see that. I was, I'm not going to lie. That was, that was fun to see. Um, all right. So that's the awards, RJ. That's it for news and notes. Now let's move on to the deep dive, which is for the draft, right? We were just talking about that. Going to take place. Uh, first round on Wednesday. Again, everybody, join us on YouTube. We'll be live streaming the entire first round. I mean, you won't see the footage from the draft, but RJ and I will be there commentating on it all. Um, and uh, really excited for it. Kraken, though, right? They've been killing it at the draft those last couple seasons, right? Matty Benier's first pick in, in franchise history. We know what he's been able to do with the Seattle Kraken. Shane Wright, their first round pick last year. 
just part of this Firebirds run to, you know, Game 7 overtime in the Calder Cup Finals. He's been looking fantastic, but everybody else, Riker Evans, fantastic looking draft pick. Guys like Ryan Winterton uh, should be joining the Firebirds next season and working towards joining uh, the NHL club. Ty Nelson, I mentioned him earlier. I mean, the list in the prospect pool for the Seattle Kraken is so immense, RJ, considering they've only been through two draft classes. The fact that I'm starting to see them pretty much universally ranked in the top half of prospect pools and they only have two draft classes worth of prospects to to pull from and maddie's already graduated out of it like it's kind of it's it's really crazy the crack can do a fantastic job drafting and that's really one of the reasons why i'm excited for this draft rj because it's a deep draft there's going to be lots of good players and the kraken have proven that they really know what they're doing not just in rounds one but rounds two three and all the way down through the draft that's it, it's so much better when you have faith in you in the the team drafting rj than when you're just like oh gosh how are we gonna blow this one oh for sure and and there are definitely some teams you know maybe a, a little bit further north of here that uh you know that, that know that feeling of, of worrying about the draft every year but we get to be excited about it yep. every year and from the very start i mean the scouting staff has shown that they know what they're doing the analytics staff too they do really great work in, in finding players that maybe other teams uh, have undervalued um and you mentioned all the examples of it there. So it's going to be really exciting. And also the Kraken have 10 picks in this year's draft Yeah, for a team that made the playoffs. And in a draft as strong as this, that is incredible. We're going to see the benefits of standing pat at the trade deadline and not moving any of those picks for immediate help playing the long game uh, because the Kraken, like I said, 10 picks, a first round or three in the second round. That's going to be yeah. huge for them uh, to have three picks in the second round, four picks that high in the draft. Uh, there's going to be a lot of good players that are going to fall as we're going to get to. We're going to talk about yep. a lot of players that the Kraken could take at that juncture. But the fact that they have 10 picks, I was just looking at um, using a uh, chart using draft pick values that I saw on Twitter mm -hmm. where it takes into account where the pick is. So, of course, Chicago has the, the highest overall value of draft picks in this year's draft. Of course, first overall is a big part of that. Yeah. But you look down in the Kraken, I think they have the 12th most draft pick value of any team in the entire draft this year. And yeah. for a team that made the playoffs, that's not really supposed to happen. You look at right. all the teams above them, they're non-playoff teams. Uh, so it's going to be huge for them to build onto the success they've already had. Yeah, it's it's going to be wild. It's going to be a really good time. Obviously, things are going to start off for them with pick 20. I mean, maybe there's movement. Who knows? Maybe they won't be at 20 by the time we get there. Um, there's going to be lots and lots of fun stuff to talk about. So going to kind of hand the podcast over to you, RJ. Um, and, and you can kind of, uh, ask some questions and, and we'll do this deep dive into what we think might happen with the Kraken on Wednesday. Sounds good. And make no mistake, this podcast, it's being handed over to me to ask questions, but Dylan, <laughs> you are the former scout. This is, this is going to heavily rely on you here. You've mm -hmm. done, watched a lot more tape. You've done a lot more research into these guys than I have. And I'm really interested to hear what your opinions are. Uh, but before we start, digging into any players or, or who the Kraken might be sizing up. I just want to do a, a quick rundown on basically how the NHL draft works. So I'm sure a lot of listeners, you know, might this might be their first NHL draft that they're watching, that they're paying attention to. And so just a, a quick rundown, I think, would be helpful here. So the NHL draft, it'll be in Nashville this year. Every year they kind of pick a different location for it. And one of the things that's really cool about it is they take that part of the arena where the rink usually is, they clear that all out. They have a stage on one end and they have draft tables for every team uh, lined up. Basically all 32 teams or however many they are that year uh, have their own table there. And the GM's there, usually the coach is there, uh, the scouts are there and they're all together making decisions. They're all walking around, talking uh, amongst the different tables and making trades. Um, so that's the cool part because they don't really do that in other sports, right? You know, in football, they've all got their own war rooms and everything, but for the NHL draft, the entire hockey world is just down there at that table. And so, Dylan, my first question for you is, how does that all work logistically, right? I mean, what's the conversation like at that draft table when a, a GM needs to make a draft pick and, and teams need to go up? And I mean, do they do they hand a card in? You know, you make your pick before you walk up on stage, right? You don't just say it into the mic and you can just change your mind at the last second. There's a process, right? There is a process. Yes. Uh, it's, you know, believe it or not, the NHL even has decided to move into the 21st century. Uh, they do use computers Can you believe and, that? and things like that. Uh, it's pretty 
pretty incredible, actually. Um, so yeah, each team kind of runs things a little bit different. Uh, they all have their own kind of philosophy. A lot of that's decided by the general manager, president of hockey ops, all that kind of stuff, you know, as far as you know, who is, who is the person making the call? Who's the person kind of running the table? Sometimes it's the general manager. Sometimes it could be the head of amateur scouting, um, who can kind of run the table and communicate with the scouts and, and gather the information and then, you know, move forward with it. Um, there are definitely some teams where the general manager is heavily involved in the first round, maybe even the first and second round. And then after that, it gets kind of more passed off to their head of amateur scouting, um, to, to kind of handle the picks from there it's a busy time for general managers. Free agency is just on the horizon. There's trades going on. You got to be in and, and around those conversations. So, um, you know, the, it, it makes sense why some teams run it that way. Uh, but yes, basically what will happen is first round, you have, a, you definitely have your board and you have, you know, the players you like and in the order you like them. And it can, run fairly smoothly right where it's just if you know you're taking whoever's the highest on your board that's still there when your pick comes that's how a lot of teams will go ahead and go buy it later on in the draft when you start talking rounds three four five six seven that's where things can get a little bit more fluid and you start asking more questions from the scouts around you. Uh, that'll, there'll be times where I've, I've certainly heard stories where in rounds you know five six and seven those late round picks where it's just general manager just kind of looks around the table and you just ask, Hey, anybody got a good feeling about somebody? And, and if a scout speaks up and is like, yeah, I really like this guy. I saw him wherever I, I thought he looked good. Jalen's just like, cool. That's our guy. And it can, it could be that like, just kind of like, all right, here we go. Uh, other teams, they'll make big boards that go, you know, hundreds and hundreds of players down and they'll just run it off the board basically of, you know, same thing like in the first round, but it's, you know, in, in round six and it's just, we're taking whoever's higher. Um, so it all depends on how much teams invest in scouting, how much they invest in having those people around. Certainly it's one of those things where more teams invest in it than others. Uh, I mean, I won't throw anybody under the bus, but there are still teams in the <laughs> NHL where they don't have like dedicated European scouts. And that's crazy to me <laughs> in this day and age where there's so many fabulous players coming out of Europe, um, especially some late round steals too. Uh, but uh, Kraken aren't necessarily in that boat. Kraken do a great job. Uh, their, their director of amateur scout, scouting, uh, Robert Cron, does a fantastic job. Like we mentioned earlier, they do a great job scouting. They involve the analytics in there as well. It's not just relying on their amateur scouts. So uh, really excited for the Kraken. And yes, for the process of actually making the pick, certainly for the first round, there's a lot more pageantry involved than later on. Um, but uh, they'll all be plugged into the, a shared system with all the other NHL teams and the NHL. And it's one of those where you kind of like a fantasy draft. If anybody's ever done that, where there's like the list of available players. And when you're on the clock, you go and you select the player you want, you pick, we select him and then he's off the board. Nobody else can select them. They'll go ahead. They'll fill out a draft card. The, the team, the whole table will get up and walk to the, to the podium. Uh, they'll walk to the stage, general manager or sometimes director of scouting will go to the podium and announce the pick. They'll fill out a card so they have the pronunciation right and everything. And then the um, if the prospect is in attendance at the draft, we'll get up, walk down from the stands, go up on the stage, put on a jersey, take pictures, and uh, it's all really fun. And then for the second round, which will be on Thursday this year, uh, it's just, uh, is it Bill Daly? Is it the, the associate commissioner who sits up there? I think it might be. I think it is. I think it might be Bill Daly. I don't think they don't bring Bettman up there for every, yeah, no, for every pick on day two. Yeah. Bettman's not as involved and it's just teams are making their picks and Bill, Bill Daly just announces it to the arena from the stage, just sits on a stool at the podium for however long it's going to take. And all the teams are just taking guys. If um, the prospects are still in attendance, if they, you know, are, are there, they will go ahead and go down to the table. They'll meet everybody, shake everybody's hands, get a Jersey. They can still do some of that fun stuff. It's just not quite the same level of show uh, as the first round, but that's, right. that's kind of how. And one thing you'll notice too, is it's rapid fire. I mean, the oh picks just gosh. go so fast. Second round is and, so and it, fast. And it's, it starts earlier in the day too. One thing you'll notice is the first round starts at 4 PM Pacific time, you know, 7 PM Eastern there in Nashville. And it's a whole event and each pick takes about 10 minutes. The second round starts the next day, June 29th. And that starts at 8 AM 
Pacific time. So you got to get up early to get to catch those second round picks, um, you know, and yeah, definitely want to follow that. Of course, the Kraken having three, but it, it's yeah. it's just a whole different type of bet. And they just run through them all the way rounds two through seven rapid fire. And they usually finish, uh, you know, in the early afternoon. Yeah. So it's uh, it's it can be wild. Those those later rounds, how fast it's all moving, you know, before a tweet about one player being picked is out. There's been another one or two guys taken. It's a lot of fun, though. It's 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 just a ton of fun. It's still my favorite event on the league calendar every year, though, RJ. It's just the best. It is. It really is the best. The whole hockey world gets together. There's trades, there's draft picks, there's uh, prospects, there's everything, everything you could possibly want. There's drama. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to that later this week. But Dylan, I won't keep you waiting any longer because as you mentioned earlier, the Kraken, I'm sure they have their list. They have their board. They have yep. certain players they're excited about, the players that they, they hope fall to them. Um, but you have a list too. I yeah. know you have a list here that you've made of players that you want to talk about, that you're excited that maybe you hope some of them fall to the Kraken. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to hear you go through this list, talk about these players. And uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about some players that we might even see, you know, as soon as a week from now in dev camp uh, wearing Kraken sweaters. Can you imagine? Oh, it's so exciting. I love it so much. Okay. All so, right. So who's the first player you want to talk about? Yeah. The first player, look, I'll start off with like the, the absolute dream. Like, and some people have this, have this player falling. Um, and that's Zach Benson. All right. And I'm just going to throw it out there. If Zach Benson's on the board at 20 and he's fallen that far, not because of some controversy or scandal or something. Say it might take something like yeah, that. Yeah. It might take something like that, but some people are you know down on him because of, size for some reason he's like the same size as Connor Bedard nobody seems to care um if if for some reason Zach Benson's on the board we absolutely got to take Zach Benson he's an amazing center wing whatever you're going to use him as he's incredible in transition so smart so skilled please please I he would be the the dream player for to fall and heck if he falls into like the teens RJ you know Ron Francis has the ammunition to move up potentially for him Right. And that might be the scenario. If the Kraken do end up with a guy like Zach Benson, it might be because they trade up to, you know, 14 or something to, to go ahead and make it make it happen. So uh, just throwing out Zach Benson's name. He's the player I want the most on the guys that might be a well, little Dylan, real more. quick. How much would you give up in a trade for? So imagine he's there yeah. at 12, 13 or whatever. What's your line? How much are you giving up as far as draft ammunition? Are you giving up all three seconds to move up? I mean, would you give up two seconds? What, what, what are you looking at here? I would, I would definitely get, you're definitely going to have to give up a second. Um, I would probably go ahead and give up. I would give up one second in the 20th to move up for sure. I would think about it if it was two seconds. I might go ahead and do it personally. Okay. I, I do believe in Zach Benson that much. I would probably do two seconds, all three seconds. I don't know. I, I think in this draft class, it's deep enough. You don't have to. Yeah, I think you, you do have to walk out of there with probably more, more than one pick in the first two rounds, given where they're starting. But Benson is a really exciting prospect. Yeah. So I'm glad you put his name in there because that is the dream scenario. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, another player I'm super excited about, and this one does potentially have the chance to fall. I mean, this is the, the glory of this year's draft class, RJ, being so deep, is that somebody is going to have to fall to 20th just because there, there can't be uh, more than 20 guys taken before the pick uh, of 20th. Um, and that's uh, Axel Sandin Pelika. So he's a defenseman coming out of Sweden. I adore him. He's my favorite defenseman in this draft class. I've seen some people super high on him, think he can go top 10. I mocked him top 10, but a lot of other people think he could fall to 20. He is electric and special when it comes to being an offensive defenseman. And I think I do kind of lean, you know, I, I never want to say that teams should pick based on position in the first round. I think you always got to take the best available player. But I do think that the Kraken, if there's two players that they, you know, judge equally, I would lean towards defender with them. I think that's the 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 spot where they could use the most prospects in their pipeline right now, um, based on the previous two drafts. 
but he is so special as far as his skating, his ability to join the rush, take the puck up the ice even. I've seen him make defensive plays in front of his own net, and then he's got a little bit of runway in front of him. He just goes ahead and leads the charge. Uh, against the other team doesn't you know give him a chance to make a line change anything like that you know he's not going to risk trying to pass it up the boards and get it out he's just going to take it himself because he's that talented and again he's playing against men's men in the Swedish Hockey League he was doing this kind of stuff but offensively his vision his passing the way he can move and walk the blue line in the offensive zone and then most importantly his shot I think he has the most deceptive shot in this entire draft class and it allows him to score some really fun and exciting goals against goaltenders because they just don't they, there's nothing to read like the ne- the first thing you know the shot's just coming at you there's no you know wind up to it there's no big flex or, or shimmy with his shoulders to get his shot motion started the shot just kind of bounces off of his stick and it's a good shot too and so I just think he's so special offensively that I, I want him in the Kraken organization I, I think he deserves to be taken high uh, defensively, he's he's good enough. He's he's probably above average. I don't know that he'll ever be more than above average, but that's certainly enough when you have a special offensive defenseman like that who's going to be somebody who can come in and one day score 60-plus points uh, with your organization, run a power play, do all that kind of stuff for you. So I really love Axel Sandin Pelika. He's right there, you know, just a notch below Zach Benson is like the dream pick for me for the Kraken, just to see him one day doing all that stuff with the Kraken would be really, really special. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and talk about two other defenders that I want to, I like uh, for the Kraken as well. The first one is the one I mocked in the mock draft to the Kraken, Dmitry Simashev uh, out of Russia. Guy was so talented defensively that at the age of 17, RJ, is playing in the KHL. That is definitely a men's league. That is not a league that's just going <laughs> to force young players into it. Uh, but he was that talented He's, he's big. He's got the frame for it. I'm just pulling up just so I can see exactly how big he is, but the internet's not cooperating. 6'4". Here, I see him listing. Yeah, yeah 6'4", 198. Yeah, uh, so he's definitely big. You'll continue to fill out. He's got a good-looking frame, big physical defender, excellent net front, easily the best defensive defenseman in this draft class. The, the way he can defend, the way he can read where guys are open and he'll subtly shift to make sure that he can kind of take them out of a play. He's, you know, obviously with that size, no slouch as far as being able to lean and push guys away if they're trying to screen his goaltender. He really does everything you could ever want in the defensive zone. This guy does. Don't ask him to ever make a play with the puck because he's not going to be able to. That's the one hang up with Simashev and really the reason why he's not considered like a guaranteed top 15 pick is that the offensive puck skills just really aren't there for him. And that is a little worrisome, especially with the way the NHL is is going more and more to become a faster-paced league, one that's focusing on offense, focusing on defensemen who can move the puck up and out of their zone. But when you see somebody who just has a natural kind of sixth sense for defending and shutting other teams down, I think you always got to pay attention to that. And someone with that size... I mean, he, he won't be a bust. It's just that that, op, that that upside might be a little capped because of the lack of offense. Someone who has a lot of upside, but maybe could be more on the bust standpoint, is Tom uh, Willander, another defenseman coming out of Sweden. But he's one I really like. He's kind of like a poor man's David Reinbacker in this draft class where he's he's above average at everything. He's just He's just good and solid at everything he does. He can move the puck. He can skate. He can defend can defend through the neutral zone that's something i always love to see we know from like adam larson how valuable that can be um for the kraken but he's also one of those where it's like i don't know if he's going to be able to continue to improve his game all the way up to becoming a a top pairing defenseman or if he's just going to kind of always be one of those like second line guys right that second pairing maybe more like a you know, maybe a more offensive Jamie Alexia kind of guy where it's it's really solid. He's totally capable of eating 20 minutes if you need him to. Um, but maybe maybe nothing more than that. Maybe he's not going to be, you know, on your top PK unit. He's not going to run your power play. But he has that potential. And so I really like that from from Tom Willander. Um, but that's that's kind of where things are at with defensemen. I mean, uh, Mikhail Gulyayev, he's really good from Russia. I'd put him in that Willander camp where it's kind of like, 
you know, he, he has the potential to be a top pairing guy, but more likely going to be a second pairing guy. I don't know that you want to use your first round pick on somebody if you feel that way about them. You can probably in this year's draft class find plenty of guys in the second round that you think can be second pairing defensemen. Um, so that's that's where I'm at with the defenseman, RJ. Any questions? Yes, I have okay. some questions. <laughs> So, um, because you look at, uh, you look at Sandy and Pelika and, and you yeah. look at Simashev and I know you, you like both of those guys and you see two very different players yeah. you know, in those two. And so you might be in a position, I mean, if you're very lucky where potentially both of them are on the board for you. And mm -hmm. I mean, if, if it's just one, maybe you go there, but, um, you, you always talk about when we, when we talk about scouting conversations, things that are coachable, things that are teachable, things you can coach up and improve. I know you, you're a very strong believer that like skating is one of those things. You don't worry yes. about skating at all because you can teach that. You can yeah. improve skating over time. Um, but I, I look at Sandy and Pelica and you say maybe he won't ever be all that good defensively. You know, that's something that you can coach a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, and then the puck moving as a weakness for Simashev. Like, which of those two things do you trust that a development staff can kind of coach up better? Uh, and is there something you're looking at for defensemen where if that area of their game isn't maybe the strongest, it's something that could be improved versus certain other things where you're like, okay, well, if that's not good right now, it's never going to get better. Right. So it is, it's a tough call between these two. I generally would lean and say defense is easier to coach up than offense. Right. Like, I, I just think it's one of those things because hockey smarts, it's easier to coach general positioning for a defender than it is to, to coach. Like, here's how to read things from the blue line and, and try to find the open guy and know where you need to go with it. Uh, and when you need to be moving laterally more towards the center versus staying closer to the boards. Um, so I, I would lean towards if, if like the Kraken had the choice, I would want Pelica for the special offensive ability and the fact that he's, you know, he's going to be an average defender, if not maybe even a little better. Like, he is going to be good in his own zone. And I think you could teach him to be even better in his own zone with coaching and all that kind of stuff. Um, whereas with Simashev, you know, look, you can you can make him more comfortable handling a puck. You can teach him where to throw it to, to move it up and out of the zone, right? You can you can teach him the system your team's running and, and where what he needs to do within that system. But if, if someone kind of by the point that they're getting ready to be drafted by an NHL team hasn't shown that they have a propensity to be able to read what's happening offensively and, and kind of see and read the zone and find the open guy outside of just following kind of what he's programmed to do within a coach's system. I don't know that that's ever going to be there for that player. You know what I mean? Like it is something that some guys just have and others don't. And I do still think that that's the biggest thing that keeps, you know, that that has led to busts. It's just the guys that can kind of read and react quickly and put themselves in the best position to succeed versus the guys that just don't really have that ability. And they just kind of got to the NHL based on pure skill when they have the puck. But the bottom line is to succeed at the NHL, you're playing without the puck, what, 80% of the time, 85% of the time, you don't have the puck. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to play without the puck. And that's just something that's a lot harder to coach. So I, I would right. I would go Pelica in that situation. Okay, interesting. So can I ask you to just rank those guys you talked about? And I'll even throw Reinbacher in there because, okay. I mean, he's probably going to go higher than the Kraken yeah. pick, but is he is he better than those guys? So it would be Reinbacher, Simashev, Sandy, and Pelica. I, I'm not going any order here. I'm just asking yeah. you to rank these guys. Uh, and, and Will Ander. I would go... Ronbacher first, Reinbacher first, probably. I mean, he's just so well-rounded in every single way. Like, it, he's just special. He's the one that most seems guaranteed to be able to be a top-pairing defenseman. So, uh, Reinbacher first. I'd go ahead and put Pelika second. I just think that offensive ability is something you can't teach. And we just know from, you know, I'm not saying he's on the level of an Eric Carlson or a Kale McCarr, but even guys like Brandon Montour, what he was able to do with Florida this year, when you do have a defenseman who can kind of maneuver around the offensive zone, create space for themselves, uh, suck in defenders, you know, maybe two or three guys instead of just one, open things up for your forwards. It's just truly special. I think Pelika has that capability, so I'm going to put him second. I'll go ahead and put Simashev third because I think he's the other guy that has legit top pairing potential. And then uh, Will Lander and Gulyayev as, as the next two because I just think they're more likely top four guys rather than top two guys. All right. Makes sense. Thank you. Now, there's one more defenseman I want to ask about just because he's got 
you know, elite name. Oliver Bonk. Any thoughts on him? I, I've seen him, you know, kind of mocked in the late first. I mean, does does the talent live up to the name? Uh, not quite. I mean, I think he would be more of like a slam dunk first round pick in other draft classes. But this draft class, I mean, there's just so many guys. Um, I would just kind of put him, you know, if I have like, you know, Reinbacher in in one tier by himself and then Pelika and Simashev in another tier. I would put Will Lander and Guliaev in a tier by themselves and then Bonk kind of one tier below them. Um, and so that's kind of how I view him. I don't know that I would give him a first round grade this year because there's so many great first rounders. Um, but he's, you know, he's really good. Is he someone that the Kraken should target in the second round if he kind of starts falling in the second round? Absolutely. Um, I don't know that he would be someone I'd fall in love with enough to maybe move up in the second round for if he's there. But I, you know, I wouldn't hate it either. I trust the Kraken and, and what everything says. But he's just one of those kind of, you know, he's super solid, really good, could be a top, you know, second pairing defenseman. Absolutely. At the NHL level. Absolutely. And like I said, most years, that's enough to be a solid first round pick. It's just this year. If you were born in what, 2000, late 2004, 2000, early 2005, you were just screwed. <laughs> yeah apparently <laughs> just, the way it just is. lots of really good hockey players i don't know something something about that year i don't know what it is maybe the lockout i don't know oh maybe maybe <laughs> um all right anyway so that's the defenseman yeah ready to move on to forwards ready to move on to forwards so there's there's been a lot of talk about some forwards um zach benson i already said you know he's the dream if he was able to fall to the crack and he would be the dream that that kind of next grouping of guys that I would love to see uh, fall to 20 probably led with Matthew Wood who was the youngest player in uh, the NCAA this year he played at University of Connecticut over there at UConn giant absolute giant um, you know he's 6'3 6 6'4 I've seen him listed as both uh, about buck 90 so he's certainly going to be adding weight over the next couple seasons um, but just what he was able to do playing against you know older competition at the NCAA level was very um, appealing I just think he's got a good blend of size and skill he can he can flex over and be a center we'll see if he ends up being a center or if he's going to stay over more so on left wing long term but the one that I've seen a lot of people talk about with is just, you know, he looks like he's one of those late bloomer type guys. He's just going to kind of progressively keep getting better um, as he gets more and more used to the growth spurt he had, as he gets used to playing against uh, a higher level of competition. Tage Thompson is the name that's kind of being thrown around or like him is, you know, mm. is he the next Tage Thompson? I don't know. I didn't scout Tage Thompson back when he was uh, at the same point in development. So I can't speak to that. But I really do like Matthew Wood's long-term potential and the fact that, you know, he was a point-per-game guy at the NCAA playing as a 17-year-old basically all year. The only other guys that we've really seen be able to do that have all turned into special players, right? And so I've, I'm really intrigued by by the the stuff he brings. I like Matthew Wood a lot. Um, Gabe Perot coming out of the U.S. Development Program, I, you know, the, the points are just ungodly. The amount of scoring he had, 132 <laughs> points in 63 games, it's insane. Nobody should rightly do that. And you look at the, the other players to do that within that program, RJ, and it's names like Austin Matthews, Clayton Keller, Jack Hughes. I mean, these this is fantastic you know, comps that, that he was able to produce as. I'm honestly surprised that so many people think he could be available to the Kraken at 20 other than the draft class is just that deep. It's just one of those years. And to be fair, he was playing on the line with Ryan Leonard and Will Smith, who could both potentially be top seven picks this this year. So, you know, there's there's a lot of question of how much of it was him playing with those guys. But the bottom line is he outpointed them. He outgold them. Like he played really, really well um, alongside of them. You know, I do wonder how much of it was really him versus those other guys. And then you look at him going to play at the U18s. 18 points in seven games. Who does that? Who does that? That's yeah, <laughs> that's really impressive. Now, quick question for you on that. Cause uh, playing with, with Leonard and, and, you know, and Smith and these other guys, how, as a scout, do you try and separate, uh, you know, if one player when they have a good line mate separate okay well what part of the play is this guy driving what's he doing what's his line mate doing i mean it can be yeah. difficult right yes it can be so you start looking at say like on any given play 
Okay. Uh, or, well, really, you'll be scouting one particular player at any given time. You're just kind of following them around the ice, seeing what they do. So in a situation like that where you know he's playing with stacked line mates, you're looking to see, okay, is he doing a good job of getting himself open? Right? Is he is he finding open areas on the ice? Is he going to the slot? Is he going net front? Does he screen a goalie? Like how what is his style of play? And then is he doing a good job of of being made available to those other players? Because the bottom line is if you're good at that, you can do that with bad players, you can do that with good players, you're probably going to be successful at the NHL level because even the worst NHL players are still pretty good hockey players. They'll be able to find the guy who's wide open, usually. That's the hope, anyway. Uh, and so if, if you see a guy is getting open consistently or you see, hey, this guy's really good at cycling, like if, if he doesn't have a clear lane to the net to take a shot, he's going to go ahead and he's going to try to cycle around, but he's going to do it where he's going to draw in defenders with him and pull somebody away from somebody else. Again, it doesn't matter who your line mates are if you're making plays like that. If you're going to be the guy who's going to si circle around the net, but you're going to do it by leaning in and, and initiating contact and wanting that defender to come with you, that's going to play at the NHL level. That'll play with any line mates you have because it just doesn't matter. That's that's you generating something special yourself. And I see enough of that from Perot where I think it doesn't kind of really matter who he's going to play with. He's going to be successful because he finds the open areas. He makes himself available. He can read what a passing lane is and put himself at the other end of it for his his guys. Um, I think I think all that stuff's there for him. But that's really how you're going to judge somebody like him or like a Will Smith or like a Ryan Leonard playing with the other two. Uh, you just got to see what they do individually. Is that going to translate to the NHL? And then know, hey, if I do have a special player I can pair him with, they can just go and you know develop chemistry and do really special things with each other later. Um, but, uh, I, I think certainly when the case of Will Smith and Perot, they're just, they're good at getting open. They're good at seeing what, you know, putting themselves in a spot to help out their line mate, regardless of how good they are. I really like that from them. And then Ryan Leonard, you know, if you can just go and be nasty net front that plays anywhere. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We, we, we've seen that time and time again, the NHL definitely does. Um, Andrew Crystal is is an interesting prospect. A lot of people have him all over the place. Um, put up really great numbers at the WHL. It's a tough league to put up these offensive numbers in. Uh, concerns around his size. Granted, he's the same size as, again, Connor Bedard. So if you're not worried about Bedard's size, you shouldn't be worried about Crystal's size. Um, skating is definitely a concern for him. I think he skates well enough. To, to translate most of his game to the NHL level? Is he going to be, you know, streaking down the ice on breakaways? No, he's not. But once the puck is already in the offensive zone, he's going to be able to put in work. I like that about him. He didn't finish the year strong. That's maybe a little worrisome. Did he, did he get worn out? Is that where the size starts becoming a factor? I don't know. But I just think at some point, production speaks for itself. I'll always lean into production. And so Perot and Crystal... Look, they just play and they produce. And in my experience, the guys that just play and produce, that they play and produce at the NHL level in some capacity too. It, they're just smart. That's all that matters. Um, Colby Barlow is a really good goal scorer, finisher. I mean, 46 goals in 59 games. You don't really need to say more than that, right? Um, I like that, but I don't know really what his ceiling is at the NHL level. So, you know, if he was there for the Kraken at 20, I would hope somebody else is probably there. Maybe someone like a Samuel Hanzik, who's a really good, um, he's, uh, where is he from? Is he, yeah, I think he's from Slovakia and he came over, played with the Vancouver Giants in the WHL, looked really, really good. Once he got his footing kind of set in North America, I thought he looked fantastic. Um, really good player there. Big, strong, physical guy down the middle. I think he would be a great center prospect for a lot of guys. He's another one, 6'4", but he's got skill to go with that size. I really like him. Um, so if he was able to, if he was there at 20, I wouldn't have a problem with the with the Kraken maybe taking him. Um, Edward Chalet, I really like as well. Coming from uh, Czechia, played in the men's league there. Not You don't usually see that, so I don't really know what that means compared to somebody playing with men in, say, the KHL or the Swedish Hockey League. But he played with men there. He looks really, really solid. I think just because of this draft class and the fact that he doesn't have, like, a highlight reel that makes you go, wow, 
he's going to probably fall, and he's someone who will be available for the Kraken at 20. But don't let the lack of, like, higher light real plays fool you. Like, this is a really, really smart hockey player. He's a guaranteed top six NHL player for, with whatever organization that he joins. So I really like Eddard Chalet also for the Kraken because he's one – He's versatile. Do you need him to slide to center? He could probably do that. Otherwise, he'll play on the right side and he'll just kind of plug whatever hole you need. He's got the skill set and the ability to just kind of play to that. And I think that that's very, very valuable, especially when you know it's coming in, you know, good, solid 6-2 frame. I, I really like him. I think he would be one of those guys that as you have to pay, say, uh, a Matty Beneers and a Shane Wright and you know the cap crunch starts hitting the Kraken and they start having openings to be able to bring up somebody like that on an ELC stick him on a third line until there's an injury then he's on a second line and then he surprises you come playoff time I think Ed Eddard Chalet is, is kind of that guy so those are the forwards I like Matthew Wood really like him like Perot like Crystal like Chalet, like Hanzik, I, I would, uh, those would be the guys that I would probably target the most for the Kraken. A guy like Riley Height, I really like Riley Height. I think he's got great vision and playmaking. I just don't know what he's going to look like at the NHL level so much. Like he st speaks more as more of just a power play specialist to me. I like that, but maybe not so much for the Kraken and maybe not in this draft class. I think you can find better players. Um, like that, like I said, Colby Barlow, he's just kind of a one trick pony. Granted that one trick is scoring goals. Lots of talk about Quentin Musty, especially on discord from backhand sauce. I know there's lots of people that yep, like, Quentin I was going to ask you about him. I, I just don't see it. I don't get the special warm fuzzies when I watch him play. Like so much of his highlight reel is just him sliding goals under a goalie's pads. I got to think NHL goalies aren't just going to play with their legs wide open the way they do in the OHL these days. I, I'm just not, I'm not feeling Quentin Musty. Look, he's a good player. He, he's, he's a good playmaker. He's got good vision. I like that he can bang bodies and he four checks well, but in this draft class, I just think you can do better. All right. Interesting. And, and as far for Musty, like don't see enough skill wise for just getting into the positions where you can slide it under the goalies legs. I mean, just, you just think there's better options on the board. I just think there's better options, more versatile pieces as far as you can plug them into the lineup and know they're going to be able to accomplish what you need them to. He's a little bit more just like, you know, kind of middle six guy where again, he's going to do well for checking for you in transition. He's good when he can play with space like that. But yeah, when, when say there's a prolonged stretch in the offensive zone, he stops moving around as much. He doesn't keep his feet moving. He'll just kind of plant himself. That kind of stuff worries me uh, as, as far as translating to the NHL. Cause if you do that at the NHL level, defenseman just reads that and he knows where he can play and still be effective defending other players and still take you out of the play that's something that worries me with musty and like i said in this draft class you you can probably do better than that you know what i mean yeah no i, I know what you mean i i'm a big believer in going for upside certainly the higher you're drafting in the draft the more you should be going for upside certainly um you don't want to spend a first round pick on someone who you know oh guarantee the be a middle six forward for you certainly not in this draft class yeah. uh, i just think that's not the way to go so I, I agree with you on that now i have a question about uh size when it yeah. comes to forwards and certainly in the first round it feels like some years forwards with size can be a bit of a trap we've seen mm -hmm. teams overdraft guys that maybe aren't there skill wise because they've got a six three six four or even bigger frame i mean we see yeah. guys like you know michael rasmussen and yes. you know lawson kraus i know we criticized that pick at the time plenty when we were in the draft yeah. there in 2015 and um because there's some guys here you've talked about some some bigger guys yep. matthew wood you've talked yep. about a samuel hanzek you've talked about liking those two um i mean even edward chalet uh, has you know kind of that bigger frame that that you want um and you've talked about guys like, you know, an Andrew Crystal, who's a 5'9", you know, yeah. shorter, and, and that's probably going to cause him to fall in the draft. A Gabe Perot, who's maybe not as tall. Um, what's your opinion? Are are, the, are guys like, you know, Hansik, Wood, uh, Chalet, they're not the traps that we'll usually see, you know, in yeah. some of these drafts where teams are going to overdraft them based on size? Or I don't know, is there is there a chance that maybe the skill isn't quite there? No, I think with those... Those specific individuals that I pulled out, I don't think that there's the worry and there's the trap because there's enough offense. Like with a Matthew Wood, again, he was a point per game player at the NCAA as a freshman, as the youngest player there. That's 
not like we just don't see that every year like that's not something that's pretty normal so it tells you okay the guy can actually play and the tape backs that up he's really good at playing particularly in the slot or coming in playing up even a little higher up closer to the boards he can make a lot of plays um from there he sees the ice really well there so i like that aspect of matthew wood i think that's going to play kind of regardless the size is just nice because it does mean when he does drive the slot in the nhl He's not going to get leveled. Uh, he's not going to be pushed around. He's going to be able to stay a little bit more effective. Very similar to a Samuel Hanzik where he's just, he's big enough to be able to do what he wants to do. He reminds me of kind of like a, a, a step down, but very similar play style to an Andrew, uh, to a Alexander Barkov where it's just, it's a solid two way game, but he plays very much, you know, in the slot, like the whole 200 feet. Right. And the size just allows him to mm -hmm. do that. He's going to be able to drive the net. He's going to be able to go in there for rebounds. He's going to be able to play make from in tight because he has the size and ability to, to protect the puck. Um, so it just kind of the size go hand, goes hand in hand with his style. Eddard Chalet, you know, again, he's just good at everything. And the fact that he then has the size, if you do need him to go screen a goalie, he can. He's not going to just get pushed out of the way. That just helps out. Uh, but there's other guys like uh, Daniil Boot. Uh, coming out of Russia, 6'5 winger, right? Uh, and he does have some good scoring ability and stuff, but I don't think there's as much skill there. Like with him, you're drafting the big body to just go and be a four checker for the most part, right? And then know, hey, if the puck squirts out to him, he'll be able to finish. Like that's it's it's a different mm -hmm. way of thinking about it um, when it comes to somebody like that. But I do think, you know, productivity is always my number one. Hockey smart's number one. You know, can they produce? Uh, and then you start looking at, okay, style of play. Do they need size? Somebody like a Samuel Hanzik, he needs the size to play the way he plays. So it's a good thing he has it. There's plenty of small guys that need size to play the way they play if they're going to succeed at the NHL level. And they don't have it. Those are the trap small guys. The trap big guys are the ones that just maybe don't have as much skill. Uh, they just bullied their way to the front because <laughs> you're not going to be able to do that uh, at the NHL level. But guys like Gabe Perot, Crystal, they just... They're just so smart. They're open. They're productive regardless. They can play it on more on the perimeter because they don't have that size, so it doesn't concern me. All right. That, no, that makes sense. And um, I bet you answered my next question, which is, all right, who is the trap guy? Who, who maybe is a little bit less skilled? And, of course, it's the guy who's maybe a couple inches taller and, and Daniil Boot. Um, so that that makes sense there. Is there anybody in this range who you'd maybe caution against picking? I know, you know, you don't, you kind of want to generally be positive, don't want to be negative here, but um, someone who's kind of mocked in that range, you just think I, I would stay away from this guy. Yeah. And it's really interesting too, because like the guys that I'm going to say are really, really good players. They're just, I don't know what their ceiling is. And I think in this particular draft class, you should be able to get somebody that you see as a top line forward or as a top pairing defenseman or something like that, or a power play specialist, like who's going to really elevate your special teams. Um, most of the time, the guys that I'm going to mention right now, you'd be thrilled to have it pick 20 just because like, wow, this is going to be a solid contributor. But this year specifically, I think you can do better. Um, but it's guys like Gavin Brindley. I really like him, what he was able to do at Michigan. Super solid player. Ultimate middle six guy. Like, this is going to be a guy. Like, you know, like every player who plays for the St. Louis Blues, RJ, and kind of just how they play and what they're able to do. And it's just like, uh -huh. they just go out there and they're efficient with it. That's Gavin Brindley. And like, that's valuable, right? Late in the first round, in most draft classes, you'd, you'd be thrilled to have that. But in this year's draft class where you can maybe get a little bit more I think you should kind of avoid that. Um, Colby Barlow, like I talked about, great goal scorer. The release is there. His accuracy is there. He can find the spots to shoot and score. He's not going to contribute too much else. And so, I, you know, what does that make his ceiling? I don't know. I'd rather take the guaranteed ceiling of a Hanzig over somebody like that. Um, Callum Ritchie is kind of similar to Quentin Musty for me. There's lots of good things that I see. But this is also where the OHL looking like a mess defensively all of the time, I think, kind of makes them look better than they are. It's a lot easier to stick handle around defenders who just look clueless all the time or, or be able to find the open spot on the ice when you look at it and you go, well, there should be a defenseman there. Why is there no defenseman there? He didn't really find the open spot on the ice. He just took advantage of nobody knowing what they're doing out there. And so I think Callum Ritchie is kind of one of those guys with me, uh, kind of similar to a Quentin Musty where it's like, there's skill there, 
But when faced with a little bit more adversity than maybe they saw in the OHL, I don't know what it is they're going to be able to really do and how high that ceiling is going to be. I think those are kind of the trap guys um, as far as this. And that, But that being said, they don't have bad floors. Like Them being a trap doesn't mean they're going to bust. They're never going to play for the Kraken if the Kraken take them. I just think it's going to take a longer development cycle to kind of figure out where they're going to fit into everything. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I know, what you, I know what you mean. Now, I want to ask you about one more name that uh, I don't think you've mentioned yet that I've heard a lot this season because we've been following along with Kraken prospect Jagger Furcus so much in the incredible yeah. season he's had. But I want to ask about his teammate, Braden Yeager. So yeah. I don't think you've talked about him yet. He's kind of being mocked in that you know mid first yep. round range as well. Uh, what do you think about him? I really like him. I love his compete level. Like he's just got a high compete level and that's just fun to see. And it's fun to watch. I think he's capable of playing with really skilled line mates and he's capable of setting up, you know, shooters like a, like a Jagger Furcus. Uh, he showed that this year. And I think his defense is really good. I think especially defending coming back through the neutral zone is where he shines. Um, I think sometimes he can get a little too puck watchy once he's already into the defensive zone. Like once once another team kind of sets up and they start cycling, he can kind of just get a little too stuck in one spot for me. But that's coachable, right? And the fact that he has the instincts and the willingness to put in the effort to get back means that you can coach him up defensively. Offensively, I just think he, again, the ceiling isn't quite there for me. I don't think he's going to be somebody to score 30 goals in the NHL. I think 25 might even be pushing it for him, but he's going to be a reliable guy. I just think he's one of those, again, middle six centers and he's a definitely a center, which is valuable to somebody out there. I just don't know that the crack didn't necessarily need it, but he's, he's definitely right. a center. He's going to be a middle six center. He'll be able to make your offensive stars look better and he'll be able to defend and, and keep bad things from happening. Um, it's just, again, in a draft class like this, I maybe want more. Yeah, fair enough. All right. So overall now, is it was, I guess, is there anybody else in this range that you want to talk about? I feel like you've covered just about everybody. I know. I anybody mean, else? There's so many guys, but, but then the next group is kind of guys that maybe could fall to the high second that you would talk about. Right. Maybe and we'll the get to that. Moving up. So, yeah, I think that's kind of it for, for these guys in the, you know, through the teens and into the, the early twenties. Okay, now of this group that you've talked about here in this teens to mid twenties group, pick one, and we're talking forwards and defensemen. Pick one name that you would be the most excited to see next week in Dev Camp. And I'm not, I'm not, not Benson. You know, in this middle range, that's kind of realistically could fall. Who's the one name? Maybe not even who you think is going to be the best player ultimately for the Kraken or the best fit. Right. The one you would be most excited to be skating on that ice at KCI. Okay, it would be Pelica. Like, and especially okay. come a three on three scrimmage at dev camp. Oh my, like that guy's going to run that thing. Like, oh man, <laughs> it would be insane to watch him again. We're talking about a defenseman who is one of the top shootout shooters for his team, right? Like this is the level of offense and puck handling and scoring ability that this guy possesses. Uh, he was doing that again in the Swedish hockey league playing with men. And they were like, yeah, no, your, your deceptive shot, your skating, your ability just to make moves behind the back goals. He's scoring in shootouts and stuff. And he's like roofing it too. Like dude's super legit. It would be Axel Sinden Pelica for me. A hundred percent. If it's a forward, it might be Matthew Wood. I think he's a slow burn prospect. Mm. He's going to take two, three years to get to the NHL level. But then when he does, he might just be able to hit the ground running and just be like a 60, 70 point guy. And I think that would be exciting too. Yeah. Sounds exciting to me. Um, and yeah, if, if the Kraken draft Sandy Pelica, check out those shootout highlights, like watch those That's shootout great. highlight videos. They are great. Yeah. Uh, yeah the, I went, uh, and I've, yep. saw those prepping for this. Yeah, I've got him mocked ninth yep. overall to, to to the Red Wings, but really my mock drafts are mostly a prospect ranking more so than a real mock. So, you know, it shows how high on I am on him, but there's some video in the mock draft and, and there is some, some shootout goals in there too. But uh, you'll just see the speed in which he can kind of turn things around on other teams, I think is is something that's really valuable in today's NHL as well. Yeah, and I, maybe it just shows how smart you think. Stevie Y is in Detroit yeah. and uh, Detroit. They do have two picks before the Kraken pick at 20. So uh, if they do like him, it may be difficult uh, 
but you know if he falls down to 17 they might just take him there so um you know that's that's something to look out for um so dylan i guess before we get into the guys that are kind of the second round group uh you know that, that might be interested maybe we'll fall to the kraken in the second um i gotta ask about the other position out there goalies yeah uh, we haven't talked about any goalies yet and I'm just curious, what is your philosophy on drafting goalies? Uh, are there any out there? I I certainly wouldn't take one at 20, and that's just no. a, a matter of course. I don't care who's out there. Um, but are there any goalies out there that that have stood out to you, that are exciting to you? What's your philosophy? Do you even look at goalies as a scout? Because it's just, they're just so hard to predict. What What's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I was going to say, like, there's there's lots of different things to it when it comes to, to goaltending. I will say this. The Kraken have a dedicated goaltending amateur scout like most most of the time it is kind of its own art and so if you are an nhl team and you're an nhl team who's going to invest in scouting you will invest in one specific person to only zero in and focus on that so shout out there um i i don't look at them as much i i'm not a goalie by trade i haven't worked with goalies i haven't ever really learned all the things that you should be looking for for goalies right um you can look at the basic stuff of how well does it seem they're tracking the puck what kind of style do they play i certainly would always communicate that whenever i was asked about a goaltending prospect well it's you know he's more of a stand-up guy he's more of a butterfly guy he likes to do this that kind of stuff i i know trends um, but like mechanically, I don't always know what I'm looking for. So for the most part, I stay away from it. And specifically this year um, in the scouting that I had to do mostly for the mock draft and what the Kraken are going for uh, earlier on in the draft, I didn't spend too much time on the goal goaltending. Um, and my overall philosophy is never in the first round. Just don't do it. Don't do it. Yep, I agree with you there. Hard agree. I uh, never take a goalie in the first round. There's plenty of goalies that are that are good late, and a lot of it depends on just how they develop, how you can develop them. So I think I, I was listening to Chuck Fletcher on the Thirty Two Thoughts podcast um, last week, and he was saying, "Oh, our our kind of philosophy is just like a oh, draft one every year, and we'll ask our goalie guy yeah. who he likes. You know, just just take one a year, and uh, this year might actually be the year not to do it because there's so many good skaters out there. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, so far, that's basically what the Kraken have done. They they uh, took Vyazovoy year one. They took yep. Coco year two. Yeah, uh, maybe they'll just take one every year. So yeah. that's goalies. Don't want to you know seem like we're ignoring them, but uh, in the first round, not really uh, there for discussion. So Dylan, on to the second round because the Kraken have three yeah. picks in the second round of the draft, and I mean this is where they have the real potential to shine here. Um, get, you know, given how many good players there are, how many first round level talents might fall uh into the second round um who are some of the players that you like at that spot and i know it's hard to predict because you don't know how the draft board's going to shake out there's guys you you would never expect to get there that will be there and um you know guys that you thought might be there that were taken much earlier yeah so there's definitely going to be some some people are going to fall into the second round like they just have to um and there's going to definitely be, be some good players in that group um if I'm the Kraken, any of the names that I'm going to bring up, I would consider moving up in the second round for. Like, if they start falling into picks five, six, seven of the second round, I would go ahead and, and try moving up. I, I think that these last these last guys are in that kind of tier above where it would be worthwhile doing it. Um, one of the first names I'll mention will be Oscar Fisker Molgard. Um compete level is off the charts he's probably got the highest compete level of anybody the the four checking the back checking i mean it's insane and he was doing it against men in the swedish hockey league and and i just think that that's something that you know as as the kraken are looking towards being a legit stanley cup contender for several years um that's a valuable piece to add as a young guy on an elc for a team two three years from now to have that compete level in that 200 foot game uh, you can you can stick him in the bottom six. He's probably only got middle six upside anyway. Um, but I think that he's a really kind of special prospect in, in just the, the amount of wear and tear he can just dole out on people is really, really special. And the whole thing, he's like a bean pole too. Like he's not even heavy yet. Uh, he's six foot, 163. And he just like looks like he's wearing guys down. Okay, if he's wearing guys down at 163, I can't imagine what he'll do at 185. So I really like Oscar Fisker Molgard. Um, I think he would be somebody worth worth targeting there. Um, if a if a Mikhail Guliaev does fall to the second round as a defender, I don't know that he will. But if he did, I would I would target him. Talked about him earlier. Jaden Perron, 
is another one of those guys where it's just like, look, dude's just producing. And here's somebody who produced in the USHL without being on the all-star team, right? He wasn't on the, like, you know, you, uh, the development team that everybody else was on. He was just on the Chicago Steel. Now, not a slouchy team to be a part of by any stretch of the imagination, but he was really, really good playing against those guys. I really like a Jaden Perron. I just think he's a really talented, smart hockey player. I would certainly target him uh, if he was available uh, higher and up. And I'm guessing you're not worried round. about the size with him? No, I'm not. Again, he kind of outproduced the size. <laughs> I don't need to ask. Yeah, no. Uh, if I'm bringing him up, I'm definitely not worried about the size. Um, if teams just decide that they just want to stay away from boring, predictable, and safe, and Nate Danielson falls, I'd be interested, but I really don't think he will. Um, Ethan uh, Gauthier uh, from the Q, the one Q player I like, RJ. There's not even one every year. So the fact all that right. I'm bringing him up at all speaks volumes. But he's actually, he's really, really smart. I love the way he plays over there on the right side. I think he's somebody that would kind of play well with a Matty Beneers potentially in the future or Shane Wright. Like he's he's just got that that size and uh, not the size, the the speed and the smarts. And I just think he's he's a special player. He's just one of the guys that I watched and I just got, you know, a good feeling about. And I just said, that's that's going to be an NHL hockey player and he's going to do well in the NHL. So I really like Ethan Gauthier. Not a lot of people have him. In Even the though he's round. in the queue, huh? Even though he's in the queue, not a lot of people <laughs> have him in the first round. I like him. Another guy I really like is um, Otto Stenberg. I think he's really good. Again, just one of those all around complete players from Sweden, you know, at, just there's like 20 of them in the NHL. We all know them when Berg comes to mind for, for us Kraken fans. But I think Otto Stenberg is that next guy in line where he's just going to be a, a middle six, really smart player. You can kind of do whatever you need him to do. And, and he'll be that guy and he can play all three positions, which I think is also kind of valuable and fun about him. But I really do like Otto Stenberg. I think he's someone to watch. And then uh, we'll, we'll mention a player from Liga RJ, Casper Haltonen. All right. And now I don't like just like Casper because that's a family name uh, for my family. Uh, <laughs> but I actually I actually really like this guy. 6'3", 207. He's got really, really good size. Intriguing prospect, okay? He produced at the U18s okay. with six goals in five games and 10 points overall. That's really good. That's really solid production, actually, for the U18s. Um, playing in the U20 tournaments, not the World Juniors, but in other U20 tournaments, point per game player. Really, really like to see that. In the um, U20 league in Finland, 24 points in 18 games, 18 goals in those 18 games. Okay, really solid numbers. Gets promoted from there into the AHL minors equivalent, but still a men's league in Finland. Point per game guy there, three three points in three games, two points in three games in the playoffs. So very consistent producer there. But then you look at the 27 games he played in Liga, RJ. 27 games, he had one assist, that's it. What do you hmm. make of that, right? Just looking at that, what do you make of that? This is a guy <laughs> produces at every single level, and he's a guaranteed point per game, if not more. And then he gets to Liga, and he only gets one assist. Now, I know Liga is one of those leagues where the young guys, even if you're good enough to get there, they're not going to play you a lot. So he could have only seen like six minutes a night, right? And that would obviously keep your counting stats low. But like... That's really low considering his production everywhere else. And so I wish that there was more footage of him in Liga. Almost all the footage that I was able to find was him at international tournaments where he looked fantastic. I, I think I've seen enough of that international footage to make me think that he must have just really been getting hosed line uh, line minutes wise um, <laughs> in in Liga. And that's the explanation there. But I really like Casper Halton, and I think he's someone that the Kraken should definitely target in the second round. That production, the size, all that stuff is there. But I do need to mention that because I've never quite seen a prospect produce everywhere but one place before like that. Yeah, that's that's really incredible to see. I don't know. I mean, well, Dylan, you, you've watched his footage where he was producing, right? Yeah. I mean, is there is there a way that he generates offense that you think might not translate to so, a to a men's league? He, I, I, I agree with you. I think my fir yeah. the first culprit is probably the ice time. But is there something else? There is an element to that. Like he does play really, really well with the puck. And so it could be one of those where when you do go into the men's league and you aren't the guy anymore and the, the offense isn't running through you, maybe he doesn't play as well. And again, internationally, there isn't really any footage of that. All the footage is him, the offense running through him because why wouldn't he? He's that talented. Um, 
So there is an element of that, in which case you got to trust your coaches. And that's where the interview process comes in too, right? Because if you do think that that's the case, you want to get a sense of, is this a guy who's going to put in the work and, and learn to play without the puck and learn to be more of than um, a team player, so to speak. Again, I'm not like trying to say anything about this guy's character. I don't know what the situation is at all. Um, but there are elements of whenever you deal with guys like that, where they do need the puck to kind of be their most effective. Does it seem like they're willing to put in the work and they kind of know like, hey, I'm getting away with it everywhere. I know come the NHL, I'm going to need to work on these other things and I want to work on these things with you. And if you, you know, you spend the time on me, I will get better at them and we're going to succeed as a team. Or is he just kind of like, nah, it's not a problem. I'll, you know, I know what I'm doing. Everything's fine. Then you kind of go like, well, okay, maybe we stay away from this guy. So I don't <laughs> know what kind of person uh, Casper is. I'm you know, I'm not going to make any reads, but that's where I would want to communicate and talk with him, talk with his coaches, certainly talk with his Liga coach and just be like, okay, what was going on here? Were you not playing him or was he just not doing what you needed him to do? Right? Like that's where them having access to all that stuff and us not, it makes it hard. Um, but he is someone that if he, if he passes whatever, you know, interview and off ice stuff you're, you're doing with, I think Casper Halton and it might be like my, like, Ooh, I really like him if he can fall to them in the second round. Like that that could be a steal right there is is a guy like him. All right. Yeah, I, I, that's a good insight into the process too as far as like the holistic approach, the interviews with everything. Sometimes just looking at the numbers isn't quite enough. And even looking at the tape just isn't yeah. quite enough to see kind of what goes on there. And wait, I liked how you said that, ooh, you know, nice. That reminds me of uh, back in 2015 in the second round. That's the one that always sticks with me where there was a pick in the second round. You're like, ooh, that's nice. Yes. And it was Daniel Sprong yeah. the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yeah, I you know, and then that's one where again, similar player, right? Play, Puck had to run through him in order for things to work. And we've seen that even with the Kraken, right? Like when, you know, it's the success on the power play, it's always when it was going through him or um, you know, when he was coming in off of a breakaway, a lot of goals that way, but when it needs to be more 5 on 5, you know, cycling through the offensive zone, playing away from the puck, falls out of favor of the coaches, isn't as productive, stuff like that. I mean, Maybe we just found Casper Haltonen's NHL comp and Daniel Sprong. There we go. Hey, I mean, Daniel Sprong might be moving on this offseason, might need another one on the pipeline, yep. you know, longer yep. term. Yeah, uh, we'll see. <laughs> All right. But those are those are Anyone the big else ones. in the in the second round. Those are your guys. Those are the big ones. And those are the guys that I would be willing to move up in the second round to get to like all, all of those guys, whether it's Stenberg, Halton and Perron, um, you know, Guliaev, if he's available, I would definitely do it. Molgard, like those, those are the names, uh, Gauthier, Ethan Gauthier. Those are the ones that I would move up for. And certainly if they're on the board come, you know, the first, uh, I guess it would be pick 20 of the second round still for the Kraken that, that being their first one. Those are the guys I'm targeting. Be those guys. Mm -hmm. And now if you're Ron Francis, how you would be willing to maybe package a couple of those seconds to move up into yeah. the high second to get one of those guys. You, you wouldn't feel really any hesitation at all. If one of those guys no. is on the board. No, I think they're all first. All right. I, I gave them all first round grades. Someone will fall out of the first round. And that's why it's like, if you, if you got a guy who's got a first round grade and you can get him in the second round and it's so much cheaper to move up in the second round, RJ, it's crazy how like the difference between like moving up to say pick 30 versus pick, you know, three of the second round, the drop off and what it takes to do that is insane. And it's like five picks later. <laughs> yeah, I, there's that mental divide between the first and second round, which is odd because especially recently, the first round has been a different number of picks every, every yes. year with the new teams <laughs> coming in. Um, so, you know, you with the Kraken coming in, it's 32 picks. And, you know, yeah. with Vegas, it was, uh, it was 31. So, um, yeah, there's a little kind of psychological trick there. Um, so that's like the, the second round guys, do you have kind of a, I don't know, like a, a, a line, a, a tier list of like kind of how many guys you think got first round grades or so? Like, is it, cause it's, it's bigger than 32. Cause some guys yes. are going to fall out. Is it, you know, like 40 picks deep? Is it 50 picks deep? I mean, where do you, where do you think it is? I would have it somewhere kind of between those, maybe closer to 40. So like yeah, I do. I mean, I, I should just do that next year. Is actually it's a tough like, question. I, a I did thing. just throw this on. But you no, now. it is. It's it's probably somewhere between forty and forty five guys, which is immense considering there's some years where it's like twenty. <laughs> You're just like guys are gonna be yeah, picked maybe, in this first maybe last round. Year, just start. Yeah, counting is one of them. Yeah, exactly. 
um, where it's just like, yeah, these guys are getting picked in the first round, but like, I don't know that other years they would be. This year, there's going to there's going to be a lot of second round picks that would be first round picks in other years, and and I think that's that's why the Kraken having those three seconds is really valuable. It's where the fact that all three of them are late in the second round makes it a little like. Eh, Maybe they do need to move up if, if possible. You know, go ahead and grab someone else. Walk out of there essentially with two first-round picks. Even if you just move up in the second round, you're getting a guy who's, you know, first-round pick caliber. Um, that's why I, I think this could be the year maybe where we'd see Ron Francis be a, more aggressive in doing something like that. Although maybe historically we should go off of his history drafting even in Carolina and just say he's not moving no matter what because I think you did that deep dive uh, recently, RJ. I did. So uh, fun fact here. So looking back at Ron Francis entire time as a GM, whether that's with both Carolina and with the Kraken, uh, he has traded up in the draft one time. And it was last year. He traded picks 117 and 132 up to 91 to select Ben McDonald. That's Got it. Guy. That is the only time he's traded up at a draft. And I, you know this already, but how many times he's traded down? Zero. He's never done it. Yeah. Never traded down to draft, traded up once, and this is many years of being a GM. So, I mean, chances are he's probably going to stick with where he's at with a lot of these picks, mm -hmm. just if history is anything to go by. Um, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't rule it out. If he sees somebody that he likes, you know, in the second round, I think he'd be willing to pull the trigger on that. You know, he did that to trade up into the third round last year. It was still fairly high in the draft. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we could see it. I'd say there's certainly nothing wrong with keeping those three picks where no. they are taking three really good prospects and adding them to your mm -hmm. system. Yeah, exactly. So the, I, I, Ron has given us every reason to trust him, to trust the scouting department, to trust the analytics department. Their draft classes so far have been insane. The fact that we're going to see, and not even the draft classes, even this, the guys that can identify and sign like Ty Cartier, RJ, like they just do a fantastic yeah. job when it comes to evaluating talent bringing in that talent and then developing that talent. And I think Ty Cartier right now, no, no better poster boy for that than, than him. Oh, for sure. I mean, they can find guys everywhere. And Ron Francis pointed this out after the season too. There's multiple different avenues to bring in good players and to bring in good young players. Um, and of course the draft being the, the one first and foremost, the best way to do it, but there are others too, uh, even with guys who are undrafted. Um, so, and, and the Kraken too. I mean, they just have such a good staff around this. The scouting staff. Yeah. I loved it how involved the analytics team is in this too. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm lucky enough to be able to speak with, um, you know, Namita Nandakumar. And, and I know she loves, loves the draft research. Uh, and, and she does quite a bit of that. So I'm excited to see what she's, you know, been able to come up with through the draft picks yep. uh, that the Kraken makes. So, uh, you know, good to see all those parts working together. Yep. Um, now, to kind of close this out, because I realize we're probably around the hour mark or so. One twenty. Um, we're good. An hour twenty. Oh, one twenty. <laughs> okay. Well, wait. time flies when you're having fun, I suppose. Yep. Um, I've I've got just a couple more questions for you here, and mm -hmm. we can try and get to it pretty quick. But um, so you did put out a mock draft. Yeah. If you haven't seen that, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen that yet, go check it out. It's on our YouTube channel. I mean, I'd be surprised if you hadn't just because it's got so many views. Yes. I think it's still the most viewed NHL mock draft on YouTube. So go check that out if you haven't. Um, but that was a little while ago. I think it yeah. came out, you know, a week, 10 days ago, something like that. There's still, there's been news. There's been developments in the hockey mm -hmm. world since then. No first round picks have changed hands, which is nice and convenient for you. Yeah. But any changes to that mock draft, any revisions you'd may you would make if you had to do it again right now, given what you know now? Yeah, I might push back Andrew Crystal a little bit. There might have been a little bit of like, you know, let's see if that gets the comment section going a little bit there. When I put him at twelve, I think that was a little <laughs> aggressive. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that was that was there's that one. You know, I have like Nashville uh, trying to take a flyer on Braden Yeager fairly high maybe that doesn't happen maybe he's more of like an early 20s pick I don't really have like defensemen go between picks 11 and 20 so I think someone in there will take a defenseman and that's where if Pelica falls out of the top 10 he'll be taken in there Tom Willander if somebody really likes him he could fall into the late teens probably I think that's something that I would maybe relook at and then Eddard Chalet uh, is another one because I have him going in the mid 20s and I think he'll probably end up going higher if somebody really likes him. So those would be the ones that I would move around a little bit. Maybe Riley Height I had a little too high at 19. It's just 
I don't know. They they like playmakers in Chicago, and I I could see certainly in the same draft you take Connor Bedard, you take a guy who had seventy two assists playing in the same league as Bedard. It just makes sense. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's uh, yeah, it does, it does. Now, my last question for you here: any advice to somebody watch if this is your first NHL draft, mm-hmm. watching all the pageantry, the stage thing, everything on TV? Hopefully, you're watching along on the stream with us. Yeah. But anything special to look out for um, that, you know, maybe the more trained eye would would see and and look out for. But, you know, a a first time person watching the draft might not think to look at. And and I'm not talking about Jack Capuano on the draft floor because you always seem to lock eyes with him whenever we're at drafts. But something else. Our special connection there. Um, Yeah, I like one of the things I always enjoy doing and and it's something I'll have to go back and do because we'll be live for it is listening to when they talk to the general managers afterwards, when they interview them and they ask them, you know, why'd you pick this pick? Because I think that's your best indicator to what an organization's philosophy around the draft is. And it's always very interesting to listen to those. If the first word out of their mouth is they were big. Well, that tells you a lot about what they value within that organization versus, you know, <laughs> look, we, we, we loved how many points he scored or something, right? Like it gives you an idea of, of kind of how they lean and, and what their philosophies are. And I think that that's always a lot of fun to see because there is turnover every year. So it's kind of interesting to see with the newer general managers, especially like, OK, what can we expect from this team moving forward? Um, I like that, you know when it comes to like the the panels and stuff that they have like if you're not watching us and even with us it everything's positive like it's never going to be negative nobody is certainly in the first round is going to be like why on earth did they do that that's ridiculous you know what a terrible pick this guy's going to be a bust for sure nobody's doing that everything is always about optimism it's all about hope and the future that's what the draft is there for so don't get washed up into that thinking everybody is going to be good because the bottom line is some you know, there's going to be busts. We don't know who they are. If we did, they wouldn't be picked, right? Um, so I would I would caution against that. But, you know, just use it as an opportunity. Watch the highlights that they're showing and then watch how those players are playing. Are there highlights, you know, a lot of them receiving the puck and then scoring? Or is it a lot of them with zone entries and they're generating offense that way for the defenders? Are they making good defensive plays or are they just showing you, look at this bone crushing hit, right? Like if if their whole highlight package as a defenseman is a bunch of hits, eh, maybe maybe that's a red flag versus like, hey, look at this pass breakup or, or something like that. Look at them stick lift at just the right time to deny an offensive chance for the other team. Um, so there's stuff like that that I look for that, it, you know, when watching the draft, those are the things that I always kind of paid attention to growing up. All right, well, thank you for the insight. I mean, that's, I, I'm really looking forward to just watching this whole thing and watching it with everybody yes. um, and, and seeing how it all shakes out. It's going to be exciting. Thank you for answering all my questions today, Dill, for over an hour and 20 minutes. Yes. Really appreciate that. Able to kind of, you know, get the more expert perspective because um, going into the draft, I mean, it, every year growing up, we followed the draft for a long time, yeah. you know, growing up as hockey fans. And I, I've always felt you've had, you know, really keen eye for that kind of stuff, even before the scouting days uh, that maybe I didn't share. I was good on the trades. I was good on the, yes. on the roster moves and the roster construction stuff. But uh, you know, you definitely know the, the draft stuff. And I'm glad you were able to kind of share that with everyone, including myself. I think I learned a lot about this draft class today. Um, you know, so thanks for answering all my questions. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, as we wrap things up, uh, I want to give, I, I think I'll, can I take charge of Go this? For it. The Go whole for wrap it. up this time. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Okay. Big thank you to our sponsor, Queen Anne Beer Hall for sponsoring the podcast as they do every week. Um, and then also, yeah. Oh, yep. There you go. You got the pointing <laughs> to it. it on the YouTube version. <laughs> yep. Perfect. Um, and then also we've got the draft stream coming up. Yeah. Uh, that will be on Wednesday for at 4 p.m. Pacific time for round one of the NHL draft. We'll get to find out which of all these players that we talked about, the Kraken select at 20 or a different pick if they move up or down. So make sure to join us for that. Watch along live with us. And then next week we've got, well, we've got the first day of free agency. So stay tuned for our coverage yeah. of that on Saturday. And then we've got Dev Camp on Sunday the 2nd. Um, make sure to come out. Watch Dev Camp, meet us, hang out with us afterward at the park. That's going to be really fun. Get to meet Dylan and Afra. They'll be up here, actually. I'm so excited. Uh, And then again on uh, the 5th, on July 5th, that is a Wednesday, uh, the second day of uh, on ice day of Dev Camp. And also the Kraken just put this out there, so I wanted to make sure to get to Uh it. Following the scrimmage at Kraken Iceplex on the 5th, 
you can meet the future of the Kraken at our barbecue in the park from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. So watch the squad take the ice at 12 p.m. Yes. to receive a free a voucher for a free barbecue. Wow. So go check that out. I will certainly be there. Yes. Dylan, you want to go? Yeah, I think I can right, do so that. I will be there. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. I will be there. Dylan yeah. will be there. Come hang out with us at the Kraken's uh, barbecue in the park right afterwards. So it's going to be a great time. Looking forward to Dev Camp. Thanks, everyone, for listening along, and we will see you next time. Hey everyone, before we go, we just wanted to give a quick shout out to all of our awesome patrons over at patreon.com slash emeraldcityhockey, especially our Terror of the Deep patrons. Absurdly Sane, Alex, Andrew, Anonymous, Ben, Brad, Burnt Krem, Kaylin, Chris, Cody, Connor, Coop, Daryl, Denise, DJ Singletone, Duthin, Eli, Elizabeth, Evan, Habak, Gaby, Gary, Gregory, Jay, Jane, Jeremy, Jessica, Joni, Joseph, Josh, Joshua, Katie, Keegan, Kepler, Kitty B. Kraken, Leanne, Light, Lonnie, Mark, Maya, Michael, Michelle, Noah, Nori, Nunya, Paige, Paul, Rayanne, Rebecca, Ryan, Sarah, Scott, C.A. Kraken, Sean B., Sean O., Sergey, Shannon, Shoeshine, Skeletal Tendency, Steve, Steven, Striatic, Pasty Kobold, Team YMIAT, Tank Commander Ty, Wendy, Strike, and Zane. Thank you so much for making all this possible. We really appreciate your support.